Hi everyone, this is Derek Harp, the founder and chairman of the Control System Cybersecurity Association International, or as we call it, just CSEC. CSE is a 501c6 nonprofit workforce development association dedicated to helping grow, support, and sustain the professionals charged with the cybersecurity of control systems. We're specifically talking about those systems that have pumps and valves and actuators, real cyber to physical moving parts, and control nearly every aspect of our modern connected industries. Thank you for tuning into the podcast. It's my hope you find it inspirational or motivating or revealing or informative, and perhaps at times even a little entertaining. Take care and be well. Hi, this is Derek Harp, the founder and chairman of CSE and the host of the CSE podcast show. And I've got another great episode today, one I've been looking forward to for a long time. I've got Bryson Bort, the CEO and founder of Scythe, but many, many other things as well that he has touched or incubated or, or advised or, uh, or built from the ground up. And he's uh, known for uh, the ICS Village as a founder. He's known as the founder of Grimm. And we'll get into some of those things as he talks about his, his story. Uh, if you don't know Bryson, uh, in addition to all the things in the cybersecurity industry, he is a military veteran from the uh, U.S. Armor, Army. He is a father. He is a chef. Uh, we'll talk about his, uh, his, his show having to do with, uh, with the culinary arts, kayaker, um, uh, a fundraiser for, for charity and nonprofit, uh, an all-around good guy, an interesting person uh, to, to have a beer with. But uh, I get to interview him here for all of you. So welcome to the show, Bryson. I, I'm sorry we don't have beers. You know, it's, it's probably a shame that we don't. Yeah, so virtually, we'll just pretend that we do, and uh, I'll look forward to the next time that that's for real. So, uh, Bryson, um, you know, you you probably know with this show, I have some things I, I predictably say, and it's like every security person is a superhero. You certainly are one of the superheroes, and all superheroes have a backstory. So, you know, where, uh, what that did you form in? You know, where did you come from? The origin story, right? That's kind of a broad question. I mean, where, where do you want me to start and narrow it down? <laughs> yeah, well, where were you, where were you born? I, I know that that's an interesting chapter for you. And a lot of people are like, you know, like me, but born in India, there's not much to say. There are cornfields across the street. You actually were born uh, and spent some time in some interesting places uh, for, for 12, you know, a big formative part of your life or your early yeah. life. Yeah, so that's where you were getting at. So I, yeah. I grew up in uh, Germany and the Soviet Union. German was my first language, which my parents learned when I was uh, enrolled in first grade, because I'm now going to a proper school, and I was graded as an ESL kid. <laughs> so they were going to put me in immersion uh, language to to get up to, to speed on English to be able to, to go to school. Uh, but yeah, I was in uh, Berlin until 1988, and then Moscow until 1990, and then moved to the United States as a teenager. Yeah, that's, the, that's an amazing uh, first 12 years, and this is due to your father's uh, employment? Yeah, yeah, my dad was in the army, and that's where we were stationed. Yeah, um, awesome. Uh, I wonder, uh, not to fast forward to you know your your recent years, but is what kind of impact did living in those countries, if any, have on sort of who you are today? Are there things you can trace all the way back to that? Because that's a big, you know, those formative years, twelve years in those countries at those times. Well, yeah, that time. I mean, we were the very forefront of the Cold War. I mean, yeah. those were the Reagan years and all of those things you were hearing about in the news. I was I was there at the front of um, and there's a lot of little uh, anecdotes and vignettes from that. But I think um, if I were to summarize my childhood, uh, certainly not the average kids. Um, I got to travel all over Europe, got to see and meet all sorts of interesting people. Um, I was in an international school, so I met I mean, I was with kids from UAE, from um, Kenya, uh, Canada <laughs> that doesn't seem as, as, as foreign now, but back then it would, I mean, I was basically a diplomat's kid is the way I would sum it up is that was the kind of people that I got to go to and meet with and participate in those kind of events. And yes, it was a, a very interesting historical time. Yeah, for sure. What, uh, you know, I always am curious if there's a, a technology uh, interest early on, um, is there yet in those years, your pre, your pre, um, pre West Point year? So no, in Germany and the Soviet Union, I didn't have access to really any electronics. Um, I can remember when we got our first computer, uh, when we moved back to the US in 1991, and I was just fixated on the 640K memory buffer that was you know, on MS-DOS at that time. And I would spend countless hours trying to optimize the boot process. My other interest where I think tied into security was being able to edit and manipulate games. 
So I just, you know, like the game's fun this way, but, you know, I can go into the source code and I can make it this way. And uh, so I got good at that. And then... Um, Look, there's and, one reason and you're in God mode. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, you can do God mode, but you can also change the dynamics of the game to make it more interesting because yeah. uh, a lot of particularly early games, the, the algorithms were simplistic. And so it was, wasn't, wasn't too much fun once you kind of figured out how basic the computer's AI was. The part that I'm actually the most proud of was in high school, uh, my sophomore year in advanced math, we were required to have graphing calculators. So um, I had a TI-83 or 85, I forget which yeah. TI was at that time. And because it's an academic device, I could take it in every class. And I would program games in the basic programming language on that. And I created some really sophisticated games. Like I started with basic role-playing games with all of these complexities and levels. And then I built a, a Street Fighter game where you actually can like fight the, the computer. Now, keep in mind, it's a single-threaded processor. So, you know, it'd be like command and then it does a thing and it does a thing. But still, I mean, it was, yeah. uh, I, I was, I was pretty impressed with myself for that. And it got me through the boredom of high school because I could always be just playing games or making games in any class. Yeah, no one knew, you know, that TI was, uh, the, uh, you know, like you said, required, not only accepted, but required instrument. And you may, you, you put it to good, uh, good alternative use, <laughs> yep. which makes sense. I think that's a, that's a, you know, that's a little uh, uh, a whistle to your future um, of the kinds of creativity and things I know you've, you've done. Uh, well, there, there's the, uh, there's the backstory origin part of that. I, I guess I, I know some of the answer to this. You have a little bit of legacy. Your father was in the in the army, but what led to to choosing uh, choosing West Point? I had a, actually I had a full ride to MIT, but I wanted one. I wanted to serve, so um, military service seemed like the most appropriate way to give back. So it was a, a sense of patriotism and service, and I figured West Point was a well rounded education. You can't just be smart. You need to be physical. You need to understand people. And you have to learn all of that as opposed to going to a traditional engineering school. You're pretty much just going to focus on being the best engineering. Yeah, that makes makes sense. Um, I think um, pretty close to minted, uh, minted at the same uh, same time period. And you know, I, our army. You know, I'm not going to say anything. I went I went the navy route, but uh, you know, army's army's okay. We need we need you guys too. So now, but thank you for your thank you for your service. Uh, I appreciate that. What uh, what did you what did you get into and what and what, what 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 became your 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 specialty um, after graduating from this? So I guess it's like what did you study and what did you what did you decide to go into or or choose for path? Yeah, you would think the two go really closely together, but they're completely disparate. Um, in general, mine do tie together. So um, I was a computer science major. The way that, of course, going back to the leadership aspect, the uh, cadets self-organize. That's the core. And so we run ourselves with the military officers and complement. And I was actually the first full-time what was called brigade ISO, information system officer. So this was in the late 90s, the Melissa virus, the I love you virus, and those yeah. were just tearing apart everybody, including us. And so I was actually the first full-time cadet to be responsible for the information security of the core. So it, it kind of all tied together. Um, I did a, a stint in armor and then I was Signal Corps, which it's interesting because what became cyber actually came out of military intelligence, not out of the Signal Corps, even though the Signal Corps was the one responsible for all the computing and all the work. And so a lot of folks ask me sort of like, how did you get into cybersecurity? And I mean, as you're, you're here, we're, we're at this point in the origin story and cybersecurity doesn't exist as a term or as a profession yet, but effectively I was doing that kind of work at that point. Yeah, yeah. I forget when tur when cyber came. I know that when I got into it around 1997, once I was leaving the military, it was information security. Yep. I think the prevailing term covering everything. Or uh, information assurance. Yeah, yeah. You know what happens then? Uh, you know what's next? I know that you know we'll get to things that you've you found and obviously you spent quite a few years now with companies that you're the you're the founder or co-founder of. But you did some things uh, after your military service. Was anything anything come out of your military service that you think was sort of an indelible ingredient again in, in who you are today in this sort of in the in the security cybersecurity arena? Yes, I got injured, so I'm permanently messed up. Um, and uh, so we were going back to as a captain, we were going back to Baghdad in '04, and you're going through the administrative clearing process. And I remember uh, E4 specialist is like 
sir, I can't clear you. You're like, you're done. <laughs> That's what I got medically discharged. But at the time, I mean, I was, I was really not, not good shape. Um, if you, if you see me, I mean, you've watched me already in the 15 minutes we've been doing this, all the shifting I'm doing, that's the injury. So um, my back is permanently messed up. Uh, I can't stand for long periods of time. Um, I'm always looking for something to lean on or sit down on. And even then I'm, I'm basically in chronic pain all the time, which ties into why I got into yoga um, because that really helped give me the quality of life to not for it to be better. That's probably yeah. the best way to phrase it. Had you, I was curious, had you been, had you made any decisions? I mean, obviously people changed their mind, but were you thinking of a longer career path or hadn't really decided yet how long you would stay in? Um, yeah, I don't know if the military would have been a career for me, but I certainly wanted to have served longer than I got to. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Okay, so now you find yourself then getting medically out. Yeah, so I'm kicked out. I, everything I've known is gone. And, the, you know, what do I do? Fall back um, on the brigade, uh, brigade cybersecurity management uh, skill set? Actually, at that point, I wanted to have nothing to do with computers. Um, I, was, I was like, screw this. And... Uh, I took the first job I was offered, um, and I was a global commodity manager for a global aerospace and defense manufacturer. And I told them in the job interview, I didn't even know what those words meant. And I wasn't being humble. I literally had no idea what a global commodity manager was. My responsibility was um, I managed the power supplies and what were called subcontract assemblies. So basically, um, complex mechanical systems, subsystems um, on military and civilian aircraft. Uh, so this is where I first got into, I learned Lean Six Sigma, um, I learned manufacturing, um, and I learned it wasn't that hard uh, with what I had to do. Uh, so I did that for a year, and then this was when ITIL, uh, Information Technology Infrastructure Library, was becoming big. And so the start of trying to create a CMDB, having global configuration management and asset management, I went and interviewed for that job. And I didn't, I'd never heard of ITIL. I'd never heard of any of these things, but I knew I knew more than the guy interviewing me. So uh, I got that job. Uh, I don't talk about it a whole lot because I feel like it takes away from my elite hacker cred, but I'm the only person I'm aware of that built a fully functional global CMDB completely implemented. And we saved millions uh, per year. And I was thinking another term came to mind. I'm thinking about just the, the stuff you're talking about. You're, you're looking at supply chain before anybody's talking about the way they do now. Uh, yeah. You're, you're right. Even, even, yeah. Okay. Well, so global commodity manager, that was my job is I was there to manage the supply chain directly yeah. um, from a revenue production perspective. And then the flip side, when I was the global configuration manager, I was managing all of the IT supply chain. And that was the responsibility because and this is where I learned procurement is your best friend because procurement and finance were how I was able to bring all the general managers throughout this company. Like many manufacturing companies, it's built up over time of many acquisitions and you can tell the state of things when you go to one of these manufacturing sites and you see the old logo from the company that was bought 15 years ago. And that's still how they think, right? So you're coming in, you're like, well, I'm going to be taking over all of your asset management, change control, um, IT and OT. And, um, you know, you're going to be pulling into a central procurement system. You can imagine what any general manager is going to be like, <laughs> oh, you are, right? Yeah, exactly. Who are you? I was successful in doing all of that because I was able to build the relationships, provide the service. I mean, we made their life easier and we made them more money. So you have to be able to crack that code. And it's funny now that I teach a lot of the OT change management stuff, I'm like, that's your starting point. Is That same lesson I learned 20 years ago is the same lesson that you need to do in whatever form of transformation you're trying to do with those same people. So let's talk about that because you're, you're, you're nailing on a huge topic. And I, I always I, you, you, were, you know, like the term bridge building, you know, building bridges between people. But it's whatever term you want to use. What you're just talking about there is this essential missing component uh, for a lot of people. So what's your advice for people who, you know, if they want, if they buy into the idea that you got to build, you got to figure out how to work with all these human beings and get them on board. Some people are like, I'm not sure where to begin, especially maybe they have a highly technical background and they yeah. have on some people skills that are maybe maybe they don't have a lot of or a lot of experience with what what are your what are some recommendations for people who you know this area is you know it's, it's critical but it's not always easy yeah uh step one know exactly what your company does to make money that sounds simple or obvious but seriously go walk the floor figure out 
how we make money. What do we build? How do we build it? Where are we building it from? Like all of those pieces, go meet those folks. They'll love to talk about it, right? And so that's the, the first step, right? Understand what's the purpose of the company because it ain't security, right? It's creating something that makes money. Um, from there, understand what are the priorities and the pressures on that. Because um, again, security is not a, a, a top level priority or pressure. I've been talking about the one silver lining to Colonial Pipeline is it turned ransomware into a, what I call a kitchen word. Your grandmother knows what ransomware is now, right? She may not be able to describe the TTPs in technical detail, but we now have a shared vocabulary of a problem, which if your grandmother knows it, I guarantee the business executives know it. And so from there, one, they understand that. And it's not that they don't take it seriously. They just have all of these other priorities. How do I put it within that? And the easiest way to connect ransomware to their priorities, disaster recovery and business continuity planning, which is a core part of a business function of something that makes money. So there's the budget, there's the priority, there's the attention that you can try to tie whatever you're doing to that and then break the, you know, break it down from there. Yeah, that sounds uh, like very, very good advice. I mean, this this sort of un fundamentally understanding that. And I've heard other people sort of echo stories of where there's been dysfunction when somebody really didn't fundamentally understand what was important to the business. And security for security's sake doesn't exist. It's achieve the mission, whatever the mission is, successfully. And uh, by the way, do it as securely as we can as we can do it, but it's not security first. And I think some security practitioners uh, that I've, you know, I've overheard so many conversations over the years, I think sometimes they miss, they miss that. So that's that's pretty uh pretty sage advice. Um what about well, we can come, we'll come back to probably, I think, this this particular theme some more. Um, what's, so what, you know, what happens next professionally as far as you go from, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do um, IT management or, cy or cybersecurity or information security, whatever it's called at the time, but eventually cybersecurity sort of takes over, uh, takes over your, your career path. When does that occur and, and over what time? Well, so I, I built the CMDB and I became pretty well known for it because that was a pretty unique accomplishment at the time. Um, I also became an ITIL master. I looked into teaching ITIL. I thought that would be fun for a bit. Um, and it's really funny how we've come back around so many of the calls I've done this year in operational technology. I'm like, have you heard of ITIL? Literally, there's an entire section written on what you're trying to do. You don't have to go and recreate it. Like, Go look up configuration management, change management. Those are called control management together. Um, look up release management, understand the service catalogs and service level management. That's fundamentally what you're trying to put upon these folks. Incident management and problem management. It's it's all there in this book already. And it's funny how it's come full circle. So I got a reputation and I got recruited to Washington, D.C. to oversee the network, uh, basically the whole network infrastructure refresh for all of the State Department consulates in the world, uh, State Department consulates and embassies, um, same thing for Defense Intelligence Agency. And then I did um, support to special forces in Africa uh, on their sites and did that for a year and a half. And so this is now where I'm back into um, government. I'm doing security and I wanted to change. Um, I won't go into the details, but I wanted to do something else. And this is just one of those things where it's so important to kind of take the shot. And there was uh, the CTO at the time. Um, I'd only met this guy like twice and I didn't even really know him. And I don't know what went through my head, but I just reached out. I was like, Mike, I, can I talk? Can I get some time with you? And to his credit, I think this says a lot about a senior leader like that, that I I'm never really asked him about this, but I'm guessing from his side, he saw somebody with some potential. That person reached out and he's like, of course, I'll give you the time. So I sat down. I'm like, I don't want to, I'm, I'm thinking about going. I, I'm, I had a, a senior program manager job at General Dynamics lined up and he's like, well, why don't you come up here and work with me? And again, you'll notice a theme here. Um, I had to Google what CTO was because I didn't really know what a CTO was. Uh, this is 2008 where CTOs are still kind of a new thing. And I was like, what exactly is a CTO? <laughs> like I've heard of them, but I don't really know what they do. So I kind of Googled his job. And he was he was very much sort of like, you know, figure it out, figure out what you what you need to do here. I built the R&D program uh, from scratch. And as a result, I got access to all of this, all of this stuff. I mean, there was a wide breadth of kinds of things we were doing. And one of the things that was in there was offensive cyber. 
And so I, they were one of my biggest um, R and D areas. Um, he left and I was like, well, I'm definitely not going to be the CTO, even though I now know what the definition is. And uh, I was recruited to head down into the offensive cyber group. And that's where I, I guess, became famous again. Um, so I uh, grew it to several hundred folks. Um, we had a global impact. I learned a whole lot because it's one of those things like you don't really know what it's like until you're in it. And it was it was really cool to get to be on that inside. And so one of the things I can say we did publicly is we provided all of the um, embedded support in Iraq and Afghanistan. So when the door kickers would clear an area, you know, you find cell phones, you find cell phones with bullet holes that don't turn on anymore. You find weird black boxes that nobody knows what they are. My team's job throughout country was to figure out how to do the offensive forensics, break into all those things to extract the data to turn around the mission packages in a timely fashion. So that is one of the the things that was in my group. Oh, fascinating. I did not did not know that uh, about your background. That's, that's I don't talk about it very often. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty cool stuff. Yeah, any anything during that period, like a story that pops out, not necessarily the, what you're talking about in country, but but anything during that period where you're like, yeah, this is a moment. This is a moment, a formative moment, a, a, a thing that's you still think about today or that, that, that you know, was a big learning moment. I guess I'll sum up where I got my nickname. So again, military officer background. Um, our mission was very action oriented. And my view is nobody wants to hear the nerd shit. So my command briefs, I just read names. And that's where I got the nickname Grimm. So when I quit to start my own company, calling it Bryson's Consultancy sounded douchey, but <laughs> Grimm sounded cool. So that's the origin of the name. I didn't know that either. That's the origin great. of the name. So that was my nickname. And uh, when I created a company, it seemed like the less douchey nickname to pick. <laughs> it was so. Um, tell me about starting your own company. I mean, I, it's uh, yeah, always near and dear to my heart as a subject. It's it's what I've always enjoyed doing and had passion for. But it's not always easy. And it first time <laughs> around, there's often some uh, moments of like, oh, what am I doing? You know, what was the startup story like there? Yeah. So, um, I mean, as I described, I, I grew this the the team successfully into a pretty large organization. And I mean, there was just so many brilliant people I learned so much from. But as it got bigger and more, I spent less time doing fun things and more time just sitting around tables, arguing with staff not to screw everything up. It was like, this is redundant and pointless. I'm going to quit and do my own thing. And yeah, I had no idea what the hell I was doing. I'm going to be blunt. I really had no clue what I was doing. I spent time thinking about it, but you really, until you cross that line of departure and you just yeah. jump out of the plane and you're like, okay. And build and the so parachute or sew the parachute as you're, as, as you're <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah. <laughs> should I be building a different parachute? Should I like, yeah, exactly. What strength should this paracord actually have? <laughs> the, the way I would summarize that time period is for the first 24 to 30 months, it was just a string of existential crises of things that you don't know are things like, hey, this state all of a sudden is saying, if we don't turn in something by tomorrow, we can't do business there. And we're like, we didn't know that was a thing. OK, like let's and everybody runs around and figures it out. And then you're like, OK, well, we that seemed to put up whatever fire we think's there. And three weeks later, some other fire shows up that you didn't know what it was. Yeah. Um, and you just keep learning and getting through all those. And then after a period of time, they stop happening. You kind of grow past the the silliness. Um, the other one I remember is, I thought the hard part of starting a company was getting business. The hard part is getting paid. So you win the work, you do the work, and then getting paid for the work is the hard part. Why? I don't know why that's hard. And yeah. I can remember this particular moment, um, I wanna say it was year two, and it was the week before Christmas, and there were six accounts overdue, and if I didn't get one of them to pay, like we weren't making payroll. And I mean, I just started calling up, you know, executive friends being like, hey, if you ever you like doing business with us, I know you do. Uh, if you want this to continue, you need to get your people to pay us because otherwise we're done. Yeah. Uh, so that was that's never fun. But it's been a it's been a heck of a ride. And that's really where I took the next step with industrial control systems. So Matt Carpenter um, joined us in 14 and he had a background in doing um, the AMIs and the the smart readers um, in the state of Michigan as a part of a deployment. And we were like, hey, you know, there's a crossover between those kind of embedded devices and cars. And 
you know, people were starting to talk about car security and car hacking a little bit. It was kind of a fringe thing. And I always remember we would go to these conferences and people would be talking about it. And there was one of two things. One, they would rent a car and basically just have a car there and be like, look, that's a car that you can own. Ooh. Or they would pull out a, you know, a particular device and they'd be like, you know, here's this gateway. And you'd be like, okay, but I mean, in isolation, what exactly am I looking at? And Matt came up with the idea of, well, why don't we build an entire basically like exploded car on a board so you can interact like a flying test probe. You can interact and see all of the relevant parts of the car for security and research. And now uh, it's all in context instead of yeah, the idea. Exactly. It, it's in context, yeah. So it's, it was our Ford on a board. It was a 2012 Ford Focus that we sourced from six different junkyards. We learned the lesson that you uh, you can't just just because parts go together architecturally doesn't mean they just go together because they actually are keyed and authenticated with each other. So that was a whole bunch of pain on top of it. But we had no money, right? We had no money with a lot of passion. And so that's where this project came from. Yeah. And uh, our debut was at the RSA conference that year in collaboration with the ICS Village. And how little we thought this through is we just had this gigantic plywood, completely naked plywood too, with you know parts nailed to it, strings and um, wires coming out every which direction. And we get there, we're like, oh, we didn't even think about how to display this. So we like leaned it against the ICS wall. And then we're like, you know what? It also didn't occur to us that we didn't label anything on here. So we went and printed out pieces of paper and taped it all around this exhibit with like lines pointing and like writing on what it, everything was. Uh, and it, it, the most common uh, the most common comment we got at RSA was like, yours is clearly an engineering project. <laughs> kind of the backhanded compliment of like, good job. This looks clearly like very technical and Obviously, you have no polish on it, so it's even more technical. Yeah, I hope you've got photos of that. I can just picture it in my mind's eye, but that's that's a thing of wonder, right? I mean, yeah. the, the polish later is is always and the admirable, but it's something gets lost in that, right? That 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 raw early stuff like that is where it's it's super real, right? I mean, it's like we just did what we had to do and make this thing work. That's cool. Yep. So so what was Grimm's um, original premise? I mean, before you started it or as you're starting it, what are you going to do? So I, because of my tactical experience and then now having learned full dark arts of what's potential with computers and networks, the gap, and it still persists to this day, is we, we always have these conversations about where's the cyber warfare, right? The fifth domain. And the reality is I don't believe it's there, right? It's still a great support, reconnaissance, and intelligence thing but it is not the end all be all on the battlefield. I mean, when you look at what the Russians are doing in Ukraine right now, they're not throwing in destroyer at power plants anymore. They're just hitting them with artillery. Yeah. Really effective and cheap. Now that's not to say there weren't things happening, but like it as a really pivotal, pivotal component of, uh, of warfare, I don't see that. So my idea back in 13 was I came up with an integrated framework for battle damage assessment. And the reason for that is that that's the common layer to translate nerd shit to kinetic shit. So battle damage assessment in three phases and understanding how that works and how to have that be a framework tied into cyber effects um, was my idea on how to do that. Uh, that went nowhere. So we, uh, we got actually, again, back through the car and embedded devices and industrial control systems, we got into a lot of commercial work and Grimm is actually mostly a commercial um, uh, consultancy. So doing your classic consulting, configuration, review, architecture, pen testing, code analysis. Uh, we do. We have labs, physical labs. We can do hardware analysis. But yeah, for IT and OT, I think the thing that made Grimm special is most pen testing companies are kind of like, hey, we do web app or we do network or you know, we'll do OT. Uh, you name the technology, we've done it. Two of the top cryptocurrencies in the world, security came from us. Uh, the very famous article that was on the front page of the New York Times on drones, that was grim. We did that. So just a, 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 a very large breadth for a very small company. Yeah, and just this year, it's 10-year anniversary, early early this year. Yeah, 10-year anniversary. Yeah. We did a decade. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's awesome. That's a great, great milestone. And it birthed Another company, if I yeah. you know, understand sort of the process from what you've told me before, 
and I think this is sort of can be illustrative for, for people too. So the one dimensional start a company, that's all I'm going to ever do. And that's, you, you sort of indicated not at your company, but working in another company, but it's true for startup entrepreneurs too, to find themselves doing a job eventually. That's not the one they want to, you know, not the one they want to do. It could be administrative and be all about people and human beings. I, one of my companies got large enough that I, I think a lot of my time was starting to be tied up in that sort of thing. And I remember not being totally happy with that. It wasn't inventing anything. It wasn't the creative phase. And um, so I think you've got an amazing story of, um, you know, you can start something and then you can take something out of that and create a whole nother something. And so both both companies exist today, you know, Grimm and an, another one. So let's let's you know, can you talk a little bit about that process. We'll talk about what you know what Psych does, but just talk sure. about maybe a little bit about that that process of when we're one one you know the cell division. Oh, there's two. Yeah, I wasn't honestly. I wasn't looking for anything else. Um, and 2016 Target. Everybody knows Target. I love the story of Target because they were, they're another one of those milestones. We talk about ransomware being a kitchen word. Well, the Target breach in 2012 led to the Cambrian explosion in cybersecurity in 2013 because they were the first company to be like, okay, this is this has to be this way now. That's what the nerds were saying. And the epilogue is they built a world-class security organization. I mean, what they built was amazing. And uh, one of the challenges you have is in testing, you get into this arms race between building a tool to drive the functional signal to test and then the defense keys on the tool. And so you need to keep developing the tool and you just they keep leapfrogging each other. And that's not really very efficient. And so the de facto solution is Cobalt Strike at the time. But Cobalt Strike wasn't meant to be that flexible for that. And it's not, it's a practitioner tool. It doesn't work at scale, pick your things. And so they came to us and they asked, uh, uh, they asked me, they were, they were like, Hey, could you build, could you build us an implant? And I was like, what? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I never didn't see that coming. And I'm like, well, it's a good consulting gig. Cause every three months I'm at the build you another one, but I feel like there's a better way. This feels like a market requirement. Define Sorry. what that is, because we, we definitely have listeners who know what you're talking about. We have listeners who, who don't as well. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, a network implant is going to be a code package that is able to have its own command and control so that it's going to call back out to, you know, your your server, your client, and then be able to execute commands on that box in an undetectable way, preferably. Um, used by adversaries uh, you know, all the time. Are there legitimate uses for that technology? Yeah, absolutely. Testing, right? I mean, security yeah. is defined by the threat. How do you test? How do you replicate the threat? Well, with these kinds of tools that the problem was at that time, there was only one real tool on the market. So there weren't any options. That was, it was a well-designed tool for what it was, but it, again, it wasn't meant to work at scale and be as changeable to the problem. Yeah. Um, and so I went back to him and I'm like, well, what if I built you a modular platform that you could unlimited build as many of these things as you want. You can outsource it because it's modular, so no no, no vendor can take control. Um, the modularity gives you a lot of the flexibility, so it makes it easier to stay out of the arms race problem, um, drive it to your own risk appetite, drive it to your own technical ability. And that was where what we called Project Crossbow was born. And I was just like, I want to do this. I, this is, seems like a really neat idea. It fell on my lap. I want to pursue it. Uh, so hired a CEO to run Grimm. I focused on the R&D, uh, went out and had hundreds of painful conversations where I realized just because you can describe something from an engineering perspective does not translate into value proposition, what people understand. So it was, I'm, this is going to sound crazy, but it's absolutely true. I would get into these conversations. I would try to explain what I was building. And there would be a point where like a phrase or a word or a sentence would clearly hit and make it easier. I'd be like, all right, capturing that. And I just sort of layered on these phrases and explanations and metaphors over time after hundreds of conversations to where I was able to describe it more simplistically and, and less painfully. Uh, and then I learned along the way, I knew nothing about commercial software sales and development, which is its own skill set. Uh, so it was the end of 2018. Uh, we raised money with uh, Ron Gula, um, Paladin Capital, and Dmitry Perovich. Um, from CrowdStrike, and we spun it out of Grimm as its own separate company. I, as I was telling you in the green room, it was actually, it was Ron Gula who questioned me. He's like, so the company's named Scythe, the tool is called Crossbow, why do we have two different names? 
And I went back to the team that day and I was like, hey, good question. Why do we have two different names? Is everybody okay with going to one name? And we said yes. And I went back to Ron and I was like, all right, we're just Scythe now. I think you, you touched on something really important that uh, that a lot of people struggle with. And it's, you know, and not, not just in entrepreneurs or um, bringing a new product to market, but you're talking about this process where you took on information and kept sort of incrementing and changing and adapting your game. Yeah. Uh, the way you describe something that's usable for somebody inside a company who's trying to get uh, a vision solved. And I think just maybe talk just again, very sort of systematically about that, because I think that's how do people go about doing that? There's I've seen, I'm sure you have too, people that are sort of selling the same thing for years. And it's like, wow, it's you just and you're not and they're not getting the traction they want. They're not getting by and they're not whatever it is that they've got frustration with. But it's like, yeah, but your tune is pretty much the same tune. Like it's been two years and now we're talking and you basically are using the same vocabulary, same tune. What you did was more like the board. You assimilated all this information and you kept changing and changing and changing your chemistry, your formula until yeah. it worked. That's yeah. a that's a replicatable thing, but not everybody has, you know, has that a sort of philosophy to do that. Yeah. And I, well, so the first thing I see a lot of folks making mistake is they, they try to keep it like in stealth, right? Well, my yeah. idea is really special. You can't know what it is. Well, yeah, great. You're going to make the greatest tool in a garage by yourself and you're going to go to the market and you're going to be like, well, wait, why doesn't anyone get it? Well, no, you didn't, you didn't give them the opportunity. You have to, you have to iterate through that. So share network and ask. Um, the other thing is, I mean, so I was talking about how I was explaining my tool, but the starting to those conversations were, what are your pain points, right? What matters to you? Like people love to answer questions. People will share this kind of stuff. Be, they will tell you if they have budget. They will tell you what their priorities are. They will tell you what they like and don't like. They'll tell you what they wish for. Ask, listen, take those notes, see where it, it, it you know it crosses over to what you're doing or is adjacent to what you're doing. Yeah. And then that final part is, the explanation of what you're doing is not an engineering explanation. It ties back to this is the value proposition and this is high level what it does. Yeah, well, that's there's a couple of really good good advice nuggets in there. That concept of uh, asking questions and then listening, <laughs> that's also sort of uh, a, a tough one for, for people, but a, but a powerful, a powerful uh, recommendation as well. So if you could go back over all these years, and not just necessarily the startup, because we focused on that in the latter part of this conversation, but just the whole arc. Any advice? You know, we have a lot of people we know listening to the podcast. We have, you know, the whole stack is listening to it. I There's people on the show like, oh, no, I've heard 10 episodes. I originally was thinking of people earlier in their career path listening to people like you. Like, how did you end up there? You know, what, what choices did you make? So if you were going to go back and talk to Bryson uh, at the beginning of, beginning of his career, what, what advice would you give him? Yeah. So um, being a niche internet micro celebrity now uh that's all relatively recent so people find it surprising that i didn't give my first public talk until 2017 because they're like you talk all the time you do all this stuff everybody knows who you are and i was like yeah but that was a new thing um and that was intentional because when i decided to pour myself into creating scythe it seemed easier if the first question isn't who are you Right. I know who Bryson is, but I don't know what you do right now. It's an easier conversation. Um, and it's even funnier because I'll get on sales calls and uh, you you get the you get the other side kind of like fanboying like, oh, hey, and it's like so. I mean, right. That makes it easier to sell. But what I would tell myself is I wish I had done that earlier. I wish I had forced myself to network and to speak. Part of that was the arrogance of the military and the intelligence community, which is something I now preach to every govy I talk to, which is you think you're special. Yes, you do some special things, but you would be very surprised how much smart stuff is out in the commercial world. We used to have a comment in the army where we did more before 9 a.m. than civilians did all day. Yeah. And it's so arrogant and stupid. I mean, but you know, that's where you all, you're like, you're, you know, dumb jocks. You're like, oh yeah, we're, we're just so wonderful and amazing. And, and, in a more intellectual way, it was the same way in the intelligence community. And it's it's pointless. You're like restricting yourself for no reason. And there's all these great people and all this great stuff going on that you just have decided from your own stupidity to block yourself from learning about. So do you think, do you think are, it's also a culture of, of don't, you know, because of, of classification work, classified work, you know, don't speak, you know, don't don't talk. And that that's a hard habit to break. It, that's a part of it. But yeah. I'm sorry. I it's 
again, there's plenty of ways to learn about what's going on and to talk about what you're looking at and thinking about without going into crossing into classification boundaries. Yeah. 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 No, that, that, that makes sense. That's, that's, that's great advice. You know, so you know, I wish I had done all of that sooner. I learned it later in life. Um, I fortunately seem to have a pension for it, but wow. When I think about what I could have learned quicker and who I could have known faster, I, I wish I had done that differently. Yeah. Any anything else come to mind like that? Any other advice for the people early on? <clears throat> I mean, the best advice I give to somebody in the field, particularly, I think there's two kinds of beginners in the the CSA audience, right? The I'm a c- control engineer and I want to go into security. I'm an IT person and I want to get into security and go that direction. And and you you get into all these arguments. Do we need certs? Do we need yeah. degrees? Do we need yeah. do you need code? Look, there's all sorts of paths. Compliance is the easiest path to any of that first step, and you don't need to be able to code for that. But compliance isn't for everyone, right? That's a particular thing, but it is most available job there is. Everywhere, everybody needs it. It is the existential foundation of business. So my recommendation is pick a passion project, something you want to learn and teach yourself, right? Like, well, how do I learn to code? Well, code a project, do something, right? Don't, and it, it should be more than hello world. It should be something of substantial depth where it is more like a thesis and you are building a thing and then go present that thing, go and share that with the community, get the feedback, learn from that because you were going to find people in the audience who self-select and like, Hey, I worked on something similar. Or I have this question. And now, you know, no, you're not the world expert, but you are now seen as somebody with passion doing a thing and contributing to the community. And you're naturally going to make connections and it'll be so easy to make that jump now. That's great advice. Follow on with, there's lots of places to do that. If somebody says, oh, I, it sounds good in theory, but where would I go do that? The truth is this community has a ton of, of APIs or apertures or whatever you want. To, you can connect in and do these things uh, virtually and and, 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 and uh, live all over the place. Yeah. You're, you're involved in some of them. The opportunity to do it is not the barrier here, right? It's work on something and then there's places to go talk about it. And then, and then pollination can happen. So I think you're making a reference to the ICS village there. <laughs> Yeah, and we were gonna we were gonna get there anyway. I think let's let's talk about that. It's you know it's a uh, well known to those that know about it, but then there's gonna be people outside our community that don't know what it is. So I think that begs some you know begs some description of what it is. But it's um and how, how it came you know came to be. In fact, we did a podcast you and Tom and I did uh, very very early in this show's history. Uh, I wish I knew the, the episode number. Maybe while you talk, I'll look it up. And it was. Just it was an interview like this, but it was only about that and how it all came to be and came to pass. So, yeah. So what uh, how do you describe that to people who don't know what it is? Yeah. So first, I'll point you to the interview for the the, the depth of all of it. But high level, um, Tom Van Norman and I um, created a 501c3 nonprofit a number of years ago um, to bring the community and industry and government because um, we have memorandums of understanding with multiple government agencies uh, with the mission of education and advocacy for industrial control system security. So uh, at our two biggest conferences are RSA and DEF CON, which is coming up, uh, although this might come out after that. Um, And then we have our own conference, which uh, grew out of when I used to live in Washington, DC with Tom nearby in Pennsylvania, that uh, was policymaker focused and that's Hack the Capital. So we've done six of those. Um, that's going to grow next year into exactly what we're talking about. We're going to have an entire day for training and workforce development. So we're going to collaborate with a lot of universities um, and we're trying to build out. Um, we've helped several uh, community colleges built out an OT curriculum. Uh, we are trying to expand that into breaking the U.S. into regions and then uh, collaborating with government and academia to make that more accessible at that level. Um, but yeah, any of our conferences, um, and we're still trying to figure out how to virtualize more stuff to make it more distance available, but getting anything from learning what a PLC is to learning ladder logic to starting to understand tabletop exercises and incident response and how to architect. Yeah, I looked while you were talking, uh, ICS Village and why you should attend DEF CON with you and uh, Tom. That was episode 40, and it was in May of, uh, of 20, uh, 2022 that we had that had that discussion. So it's it's out there for people to look up. And the, and so the ICS Village just uh, would, where how many places does do people can can people go see it? You know, in a year. Uh, it changes every year, and COVID has made that a yeah. question. So yeah. 
Uh, ICSvillage.com is where we post all of our, our things. You can check us out on Twitter or LinkedIn too. Yeah. Not sure. I think we're going to be doing Texas Cyber in October. I don't know what other conferences we're doing this year. I would ask if you run a conference and you would like us to support it, um, please ask us at least three to six months out. Uh, that is one of the challenges we have is folks kind of a month away are like, hey, could you do this next month? And it's like, yeah. no, that's <laughs> we're yeah. a volunteer led organization. Um, so this is Tom and I and uh, just uh, and we now have regulars that are contributing, whereas before it used to be just Tom and me by our, ourselves. So um, it's growing. It, we're getting more capable, but it takes folks to come and participate to, yeah. to keep it going. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think last time I saw it was uh, in February. That's four. And you, you're pretty much predictably doing it there, aren't you? I will. I do, don't want to speak, but I will put a, a little teaser for you that we have something very special that is probably going to happen at S4 next year. But cool. I don't want to commit to that until I know 100 percent sure it's happening. Yeah. It's like 90 percent at the moment. All right. All right. Awesome. Awesome. That'll be that'll be that'll be something to put on the radar for when it gets locked in. Um, I'll, I'll you'll you'll want us to come and talk to you about it. OK, cool. Then reach out and yeah, let me know um, uh, about that. Um, OK, well, I, I know we could go on you know, forever. Um, and so I wanted to ask you about the cooking, uh, the cooking show and the term unicorn, which is so used in our space, you know, to define you know, unique individuals that truly understand multiple domains, control system domains and cybersecurity domains. And it's a narrow, the more you say you got to know all this stuff, it narrows and narrows the field. It's rare like unicorns. And then people, I don't know if you coined or who coined it, the purple unicorn. It's like, no, it's even rarer to find somebody that really understands these domains. Um, the purple unicorn is even rarer than a unicorn. Um, and you've got unicorn in your in your logo and you're known it. You, you've got it on your shirt right now. <laughs> Um, and then you have a show that's you know that uses the term. So you got to you got to tie in the unicorns and and the show. Sure. Wow, you threw out a lot of things. I'm going to try to work through them all. So first, well, we're we're, up, so we just got to compress into this final moments together. You know everything. So at Grimm, we used to do an annual T-shirt contest for DefCon, and one year I came up with the idea of a Grim Reaper riding a unicorn because I thought it was really funny. The juxtaposition of Grimm and the mythical and you know generally uh, very positive unicorn and the design just blew up. Uh, so Derek, uh, plan B after cyber fails is I'm gonna go into merch. And it was after that that I was spinning out Scythe. And I was like, well, we had this really cool logo we built for Grimm with a graphic artist from Blizzard. How do I replicate that? So can't do anything with the Grimm because that's going to be brand confusion. A scythe is just a piece of wood and metal, so it's not that interesting. People seem to be really into these unicorns. So I came up with the idea of the unicorn with the scythe, which is our logo. And so it, it follows what I call the, the Disney philosophy is kids think it's cute. Adults get the joke. So it works on several levels. Um, and then, of course, once I had done this, I started dressing up as the unicorn because I don't know. Why not? I mean, let's do that. And then since you mentioned the purple unicorn, uh, so this ties back to Scythe's mission. So we're a, I mean, technically we're a modular malware platform. It's the ability to recreate any post-access malware from scratch like that. And the value of that was that's really good for IT testing. And for the longest time, I kept telling people because I was, I was known for the operational technology work and everybody figured Scythe is an operational technology tool as well. And I was like, no, I would not not do that. <laughs> and um, that changed, and this goes back to the purple. So at our core, we're a red team platform. The ability to recreate threat behavior realistically is a red team thing. Going to your earlier question of what else I wish I had told a younger me, I wish I had told a younger me because it took me four years to figure it out. There is no such thing as a red team product market. Scythe was built for a market that literally did not exist. And where we saw the gap in that market was that the problem with red teaming is, one, it's really hard to find operators. It's a very niche space. And there is no such thing as a junior operator. You are very good or you are not allowed on keyboard because you could potentially cause trouble. Well, people don't scale. The tools that we're working with them didn't scale. And so we saw this big gap between there's all of these defensive requirements for validation and testing. There's a communication challenge and there's a people problem. Well, that's what our tool was then focused on solving. And so this is why we really pushed purple teaming 
hence the purple unicorn, because purple teaming is that collaborative and that communication approach with red and blue together. Um, so if you've heard of the purple team exercise framework, that's us. We wrote that book years ago, um, and it's how we built success and with the purple unicorning as that being our mission with it's not about just driving testing. It's in a way that is business friendly and actually makes a difference, not just, hey, we found things that are wrong. And that tied into the OT side because um, in collaboration with Megan Samford, who's chief product security officer over at Schneider Electric, she um, worked with us. We came up with this idea of what we call the beachhead, which is taking the Purdue model and breaking it into IT, which was obvious where we were already operating. But those higher level industrial control systems, HMI, SIS, DCSs, that one, typically run an old enterprise operating system, Windows or Linux. Two, I don't have to actually attack them to take them over. And three, I don't have to do anything to be able to demonstrate access with the assumption of impact. And if you look at the most common threat vectors that happen in operational technology, it's IT moving laterally, crossing into that DMZ and taking over those higher level systems because as a threat, I'm lazy. Why build code? I don't have to. And HMI already speaks the protocols to everything it touches. It already knows where everything is because it's in the architecture and it just tells everything to do what you want. What else could I want to do as an attacker than that, right? Like, so that's what our, that's where we realized we were able to bring both of those things together so you can now combine and show how IT affects OT, which is something I think a lot of IT security people don't realize. Like you are in fact defending the OT environment by what you're doing in IT. Just nobody has ever linked those things together. And so that's where our, our tool was able to show the purple piece with IT and OT and bridging that gap as well. So this leads to the cooking show, which um, from the unicorn. So uh, started the pandemic, the world goes crazy. Everybody loses their mind. And I'm like, all right, well, so I started doing costume contests and happy hours and just different things to like keep people alive, <laughs> alive and social. Yeah. And I already had a, um, I was already well known for cooking with my friends because um, I love to cook. And I was like, well, I got to cook anyway. So I might as well just share that. And I'm not interested in me just being the cook. So the format for the show is it's a different guest each week. The guest comes up with the recipe, publishes the recipe a week in advance so everybody can buy and cook along with us. Yeah. The guest highlights a charity. So we've raised over $40,000 for various charities. And then it's 30 to 40 minutes of us just cooking that food together in parallel. And I, they're, the, they're basically the star. I'm the color announcer there. We, we'll talk food. We'll talk techniques. We'll talk life. We'll talk security. I mean, whatever the guest, whichever way it goes. And it's fun because... Um, we've had very famous people in the industry come on, and it's interesting to see them show their passion for cooking. Uh, we've had folks come on who don't know how to cook, which I, I, you know, it's a bold choice to come on a cooking show, but those are oh, funny. And bold. then we've had uh, professional chefs come on, and like those are like serious episodes. So um, we're in a bit of a hiatus right now, but we've done about 160 episodes. So if you Google Unicorn Chef and my name, you'll pop them all up, and you'll see tons of people you know in the space um, all doing different shows with me. That's awesome. And you mentioned uh, Megan Sanford. Um, she is episode 79 in this series. And, and uh, what, a, what a great, great uh, person in the industry. And uh, so um, if anybody wants to look into her after you mentioned her, they can go hear her story on, on episode 79. So um, I love the cooking story. And I love how that, I mean, this podcast was invented out of COVID as well. It's like, we got extra time. We're sort of stuck. I know interesting people. And maybe I could talk to them and then everybody who's trapped in their home, wherever they are in the world, could sort of, you know, listen to them. So uh, it, 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 I had no idea what sort of turned into what it is, uh, what it is today. But that's, yeah, COVID had some silver linings. I, I still maintain that. It's like it had some negatives, but I embraced and looked for some silver linings. Well, uh, now we come to the part of the show uh, that I like to do, the Pavot questionnaire, which I borrow from a television show called Inside the Actor's Studio. The longtime mm -hmm. host, James Lipton. Uh, who is now passed on, um, would use this questionnaire that he got from a French show, that's the name. And so I think this has got 30, 40, 50 years of, of legs to the same exact 10 questions to the best of my knowledge. And um, so it's my tip of my hat to those shows and a fun way to end the show. Um, if you're up for it, we'll do the uh, Pavot questionnaire. Okay. And for those of you who are just listening and you know, you're not seeing this, there has been ever since the discussion of unicorns, a unicorn horn on 
Bryson's head. So, you know, this makes it even, even more ideal. <laughs> All right. What is your favorite word? Defenestrate. Yeah, no, there's a story to it. So uh, with all of my kids, that was my like humorous threat. Like, you know, the kids always, you know, doing something, you know, they're not supposed to do. And I'd be like, I'm going to defenestrate you. So it's hilarious because, I mean, they definitely could say mom or dad first, but probably the third word that, you know, a 18 month old would know was defenestrate, which is hilarious. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's um, Latin root for to throw out the window. I was going to ask you, had to be defined. Okay. What is your least favorite word? Moist. What turns you on, creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Folks helping each other. What turns you off? When folks don't do that. I, I hate the, the condescending asshole thing that our industry seems to really thrive on. What is your favorite curse word? Fuck. What sound or noise do you love? Laughter. What sound or noise do you hate? Nails on a chalkboard. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? So, I mean, I'd like to say I'd like to be a chef, but to be frank, I don't want to do something I love for work. I always saw myself as a frustrated philosophy major. So if that was something I could actually make money off of, I would love to just be free in philosophy. And what profession would you not like to do? I don't know. And last, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Welcome. I'm just finishing up with Bryson Bort, CEO and founder of Scythe and many other things, uh, Grimm and the ICS Village and a laundry list of, of projects and initiatives uh, that he has touched. Bryson, thanks for not only coming on the show and being a strategic partner of CSE and being my guest host, giving me some uh, a relief throughout the year here and there to, to not do every single show, uh, live show on Wednesdays at one. I'm, I'm, uh, you've earned a special place in my heart for that as we try to keep the op tempo uh, up. Uh, and, and for everything you've done in the industry, and there's just, uh, you know, so many things that uh, your, your imprint and DNA is on. So I do, I do want to jump on that because the last host I did was with Gary Kessler, who I work with at the ICS Village on the maritime stuff. So it was, it was really funny because we're like, no, it's us again. <laughs> It, it is. It's a small world in that way, right? I mean, uh, you know, when I met Gary, and then when his timing came up, it was when I was on a trip, and then you know, you you graciously agreed to do some of these episodes every year, not knowing at all that the two of you, you know, already knew each other. But I love that's the way, you know, that's the way it works, right? You you never know. But uh, that that he was very highly rated. Your guys' show was very highly rated. It was a, uh, in fact, it was sort of off the charts. Uh, that that recording is going to get replayed because it was. Um, it really hit that audience who came that day. Um, loved it. I think it was our top performing score maybe in our history. Awesome. Well, that's all Gary. I was just there to be color. Hey, but you know what? There's a role because I'm usually the color. So that's color, guys. We got, you know, we got to be there. So uh, yeah, thank you for providing uh, color on that. But uh, again, thank you for, for all the things you do. And um, it's a pleasure knowing you. And I look forward to uh, when we can have that beer we referenced earlier in person. We'll, you know, we'll have to work on that. It's got to come somewhat soon. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you and good night.